Hey, good afternoon. Sorry about the lateness of this video. I had some internet issues today and uh, they just recently got fixed, so I apologize. I uh, hope you forgive me. Uh, we're going to talk about the Holocaust today, and this is kind of a hard one to talk about just, you know, without seeing you guys face to face, but I'll do the best I can here. Um, you know, usually I would talk about the, the Mouse book and the One Day in Just Bo. We'd have some interactive conversations, so all I can do at this point is hope and trust that you have read the, that information. Now let's talk about Jewish life in Europe before the Holocaust. Um, Jews lived in every country of Europe uh, before the World War II. Um, all total estimates are there's somewhere about 9 to 10 million Jews living in Europe. Um, there's 21 different countries. And by the end of the war, two out of every three Jewish people would be dead. Um, you find the largest Jewish population in Poland, and they lived in uh, small towns called Shtetls. And there's this unique culture that develops in Jewish communities called Yiddish. Um, it's not just a stereotype, it was actually a thing. You find uh, this Yiddish language where traditional Hebrew is mixed with local languages. You'll find Yiddish language theaters, Yiddish language movies, etc., etc., Yiddish language music. Uh, so it's a unique culture that's going to develop. And you're going to find Jewish people in all sorts of professions. There's Jewish farmers, tailors, doctors, government officials, you name it. Um, so Jews are pretty ingrained and pretty involved in European life. Now, I mentioned this on Tuesday, the Nuremberg Laws, uh, 1935. That's what deprived Jewish people of German citizenship. Uh, Jews were forbidden from marrying what were called Aryans. That meant uh, pure-blooded Germans. And you were considered a full Jew if you had three grandparents who were Jewish. If you only had two parents, or I'm sorry, two grandparents who were Jewish, you were called a Mishnah or mongrel of the first degree. And if you had one Jewish grandparent, you were still considered a Mishnah or mongrel of the second degree. So any Jewish blood meant that you could not be a pure Aryan German. Now, the poster that you see there, it says, Wer uh, dieses Zelschen trägt, ist ein Fiend unseres Volk. Basically, the Jew is your enemy, is what that says. And the Jewish people, after the Nuremberg Laws, were forced to wear that gold or yellow Star of David on their clothing to show that they are a Jewish person. Now, something you may not have ever heard of before is the Avion Conference. And this happens in the summer of 1938. Uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt is the one who actually calls this. And it's to try and discuss what's going to happen with the Jewish people. It was no secret that the Jews were being persecuted in Germany, but what was called in the question is, what do we do about it? So there are 32 countries that meet between July 6th and July 19th in 1938. And a lot of countries had immigration quotas, including the United States. Uh, if you take my U.S. History 2 class ever, um, we spend an entire day talking about immigration and what the quotas were. Um, there were not very many Jewish people who were going to be allowed in this country simply because the United States didn't want people from Eastern Europe or Southern Europe into the country. And the Great Depression meant that there's no way that the United States is going to let in more people. So. What happens at the Avion Conference is all the countries in attendance, they agree that the Jews are in a situation, but none of the countries are willing to let German Jews in, or Polish Jews for that matter. Um, there were even talks about setting the island of Madagascar aside for Jewish populations, but that never really got off the ground. Ultimately, there are only two countries that agree to take Jews. The Dominican Republic says we'll take 100,000 Jews, um, we'll give them jobs, and Costa Rica takes 800. That's all out of 9 million Jews, or well, not 9 million, but over a million Jews that were in Germany. That's all that anybody says, yeah, we'll take them. All right, so we have something called the T4 Euthanasia Program. This is started in the fall of 1939. And it's headquartered in a suburb of Berlin called Tiergartenstrasse Number 4. 
And it's all about racial hygiene, racial purity, keeping the German race pure and superior, and killing or sterilization of inferior races. Those inferior races or those inferior people include Jews, gypsies, the mentally deficient, the physically deficient, the insane, or the terminally ill. And using this T4 euthanasia program, between December 1939 and August 1941, there are somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people killed. We don't know the exact number. And they're killed either by lethal injection or by gas. Now, this is not considered part of the Holocaust. This is before the Holocaust begins. Uh, ghettos. Ghettos are set up for Jewish people to live in throughout Poland after World War I starts. And these are basically going to be transition camps before Jews are moved to either death camps or concentration camps. And there are five major ghettos set up throughout Poland. There's Warsaw, Lodz, uh, Krakow, Lublin, and Lvov. And all total, 356 ghettos are going to be established by the Nazis. They're not going to be just located in Poland, they're going to end up being ghettos in occupied Soviet Union, Romania, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. In fact, when the Nazis get to Lithuania, which I think I might have spelled wrong there, and if I did, I'm sorry, but when the Germans get to Lithuania, they find that Lithuanians are doing their own ethnic cleansing before the Germans even tell them to do it. Uh, the larger ghettos are going to be sealed off with brick or stone walls. Uh, the ghetto in Warsaw had 10 foot tall walls all around it. Uh, the smaller towns or the smaller ghettos, they don't have walls, but they are still um, watched and the Jews are not allowed to leave. Now the Warsaw ghetto is the most famous of these ghettos. It's established in October of 1940. There are 400,000 Jews forced to live in a three and a half square mile area. I did the math and I played with a couple of maps. Three and a half square miles, that roughly covers the same size as downtown Atlanta, going from where Ikea is down to the former Brave Stadium, what is now the uh, Georgia State football stadium. That's basically three and a half square miles. And they put 400,000 people in there and forced them to live. There's lots of disease. There's starvation. There are some pretty nasty conditions. And then, as I said, a 10-foot wall surrounds the ghetto. 300 to 400 Jews died each day. And by July of 1942, over 80,000 of the original 400,000 have died. Now, there are forms of resistance that happen in the Warsaw Ghetto. There's education, meaning Jewish education. Jewish religious services, Jew traditional Jewish music is played, and there's still the continued celebration of Jewish holidays. Now the Warsaw Ghetto uprising is the most significant uprising of Jews during the Holocaust. In January 1943, a guy named Heinrich Himmler, who is the head of the SS, or the brown shirts of the Nazi party, are ordered to remove the last 60,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto. Well, news of this order gets out and between January and April of 1943. The Jewish people in Warsaw start getting weapons and supplies smuggled in so they can fight back when the German army comes. Well, on April 19, 1943, German tanks bust into the Warsaw ghetto and the Jews fight back. It was completely unexpected. The Jewish combat organization known as the ZOB, they're going to lead the fight and the resistance lasts for 28 days. The reason the resistance ends is the German troops start to burn down the ghetto buildings one by one. And finally, on May 16th of 1943, the resistance is brought to an end. All right, concentration camps. When you think of the Holocaust, you probably think of concentration camps. Well, the first concentration camp is called Dachau. And Dachau, um, it was established on March 20th, 1933, way before the war started. Uh, Dachau was originally a training ground for the SS and it served as a political prison for those who were anti-Nazi. In 1938, after Kristallnacht, uh, the first 10,000 Jews arrive. Uh, two crematoria are built to take care of all the dead bodies. 
And by 1942, gas chambers are built, but the gas chambers at Dachau are never used. What is done at Dachau are medical experiments. Um, Jews are forced to drink salt water. There are um, surgery experiments. How long can a body live without X body part? Um, there are experiments on pain done. Um, it, it's a really, really disgusting thing. And all total, somewhere around 50,000 people are going to die at the uh, Dachau camp. That is also before the Holocaust actually starts. Well, what is the Holocaust then? Well, the Von Z conference is really where the Holocaust is going to be formulated. On July 20th, 1941, these a bunch of high-ranking Nazi officials, they meet in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee. And that's the actual building where this conference held, was held. Uh, and the goal was to find a, quote, final solution to the Jewish question. And the Wannsee conference is going to be the first time an actual plan is put down on what to do with the Jews. Now these words used in the final solution, they're purposely vague because that way there could be plausible deniability. All right, Einsatzgruppen. Uh, these are mobile killing squads. If you read, and let me go to it real quick, if you read One Day in Josepho, this is about an Einsatzgruppen. Um, the people in this article are not Nazis. I mean, it, it is hard to believe. Uh, let me scroll down. I hope you can see this scrolling here. Um, it says one such unit reserve police battalion 101 from Hamburg was one of the three police battalions stationed in the district of Lublin during the onslaught against the Polish ghettos. Now why that is important, Hamburg is a place where the Nazis did not have a lot of support. But you have this reserve police battalion being told to go out and kill. Most of the people in the reserve police battalion were older. You remember the, the Nazis got most of their, their support from younger people. If you look right at the bottom, um, it says their ages ranged from 33 to 48. Five were party members, but none belonged to the SS. These were people who were not Nazis, and they were part of this Einsatz group. And, and told to go and kill. Now, if you thought that this is one day in Josepho was interesting, it was actually worked by Christopher Browning into a bigger book. This book called Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland. If you're interested in this, I do have a, quote, completely free, unquote, PDF version of this I could give to you. If you are interested in reading more about this reserve police battalion, send me an email and I will reply to you with that PDF file. Now, why did I have you read this article? It's to show you that the people who were doing this were not all Nazis. It was made up, yes, there were some Nazi units in the Einsatzgruppen, but it wasn't all. There were civilians, there were police units, there were non Nazis who participated in the Holocaust. The job of the Einsatzgruppen and the job of the Reserve Police Battalion 101 was to kill any Jewish person they could find in occupied Soviet territory. They round up Jews in small towns. They lead them to a killing field. They shoot them in the back of the head. And if you read the, the article, you see that these men, they weren't even trained in how to do it. But they're told to kill Nazi or to kill Jewish people in mass numbers. The, the um, deceased are just dumped into mass graves without care for whether they're really dead or not. Um, I mean, it's disturbing to read. Now, there are multiple types of Nazi camps. There's the death camp. Their sole purpose is to kill all Jews. Concentration camps, they are used uh, to control and keep Nazi, or to keep the Jewish by the Nazi party until they decide what to do with them. There's transit camps where you are going from a death camp to a concentration camp or vice versa, or maybe it's a stop until you get to one of those camps. And then there are labor camps as well where the Jews are used as slave labor. 
Now there's six major killing camps. Uh, Auschwitz, which is the best known. But there's also Belzec, Kalmo, uh, Maldinek, Sobibor, and Treblinka. All those are the major killing camps. But Auschwitz, let's talk about that though. Uh, Heinrich Himmler is going to order a man named Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess is the, the one in charge of Auschwitz. And Rudolf Hess is told to make a plan to mass exterminate the Jews. And um, Auschwitz is going to be the first camp to use Zyklon B gas. What would happen is the Jews would all be lined up. They would be put into a big shower room told that, you know, we're just going to give you a shower, we're going to clean you up, and then we're going to send you on your way to a camp. Well, in reality, when the the shower heads turn on, it's not water that comes out, it's this Zyklon B gas. And an entire room of multiple dozens of Jews could be killed in less than five minutes. On average, 12,000 lose their lives at Auschwitz per day, and at its peak, the death rate was 24,000. To all total, two and a half million Jews are going to die at Auschwitz along with uh, gypsies as well in that total. Now there is some resistance to the Holocaust and uh, there's resistance in many forms and if you read Mouse you see some of these resistance forms take shape. There's hiding. For example, there are people in Mouse hiding everywhere. Vladik, the main character, hides. His wife Anna hides. The family hides. Uh, sometimes the hiding is in uh, plain sight. Vladek pretends to be a Nazi or a German. Sometimes there are people hiding in trash bins, in wells, in walls, in fake rooms. Um, there's food that's smuggled. There's clothing that's smuggled. There's medicine that's smuggled. Even in the camps, when Vladek is captured and he makes deals with the camp commanders, um, there are resistance is there. There are rebellions in the ghetto, like the Warsaw Ghetto. There are rebellions in the work camps. There are underground newspapers, underground concerts, underground plays. There's a whole underground culture happening. And then there is a persistence of the Jewish religion, a persistence of the Jewish faith. Now there's also outside assistance. Before I tell you about the outside assistance, your word of the day. Today's word of the day is internet. My internet was out, that's the reason this video is late, so today's word is internet. Once again, I apologize for making you wait for this video. But outside assistance happens for Jews. Denmark, the king of Denmark, completely prevents the death of Jews. He refuses to turn over Jewish people. Um, he says basically the Jews are Danes and if you, we have to turn over Jews then we have to turn over everybody. Passports are issued to the city of Shanghai. Shanghai, if you remember, that is part of China. China and Japan were in the middle of fighting and so there was nobody to check the passports whether they were legit or not. So thousands of Jews are able to escape Europe with a passport saying that they're going to Shanghai. In reality, very few go there. But today, surprisingly, there is a very large Jewish population in China because of this. And then there's Oscar Schindler of Schindler's List. He would purposely hire and ask for Jewish laborers, and then he would protect them once he was employing them. Yes, six million Jews are going to die because of the Holocaust, but because of resistance, both inside and outside resistance, over two million Jews are able to, to survive. Now liberation happens in 1945. There were troop um, rumors of these killing camps when nobody had found them, but the armies of both the Soviet Union and uh, the United States are going to stumble upon these camps. And just what they find is appalling. Um, the Supreme Allied Commander, Gen General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who will eventually become President Eisenhower, insists on photographing and documenting evidence. And I must tell you, I have seen some of the, these, uh, these photographs. My grandfather was in a tank group who 
was one of the first Americans to enter some of these concentration camps. And my grandfather snuck out pictures that he wasn't supposed to have and sent them to my grandmother. And I mean, it's, it's disturbing. But Eisenhower, he insists on photographing and documenting the evidence so that the world does not forget and that proof of these atrocities is kept. And then villagers who turned a blind eye to everything who lived near these death camps were forced to tour and view the sites and be shown what they allowed the Nazi government to do. Um, I don't know if that was right or wrong. Maybe that's a, a um, philosophical question, but... That's what happens. All right. Now, as far as Mouse goes, uh, I do hope you read that. Mouse is one of the best examples of what happened during the Holocaust and how one survived it. It's based on a true story. Uh, Art Spiegelman, the, the author and illustrator of Mouse, Vladek was his dad. And he interviewed his dad in the 1970s before his dad died of a heart attack. And that's a true story. So what you read there is an actual account of what happened. The first book is what happens during the Holocaust. The second book is primarily about how the Holocaust affected Art's dad, Vladek. So I sincerely hope that you read that book, Mouse, The Complete Mouse, because it is a strong powerful book and I apologize that we can't spend a day talking about it because that's normally what we would have done if this class was meeting in person. Um, but I tell you, you know, there will be a question on mouse on the, the final exam, so if you haven't read it, uh, you will need to read it. But I sincerely hope that you have taken the time to read both One Day in Josepho and Mouse because they are both disturbing and powerful. One shows you who did the killing, the other one shows you who the victims were. So if you wondered why those were the assignments for today, that's why, to show you both sides of what happened. All right, let me turn the camera around. All right, so um, I think I've got all your SLOs, rough drafts back. Make sure you read it, the comments and keep working on those rough drafts. If you're gonna take any summer classes, make sure you get signed up for them. Uh, I know my classes have plenty of space available and there are a lot of classes out there where we're just kind of begging students to take them. And then last but not least, make sure that you are working on your museum review as well. Uh, don't wait till the last minute. Go ahead and start looking at some of those museum sites or watching some of those movies and giving me your critique. Uh, just get it out of the way, get it done. But um, other than that, I hope you have a good weekend. I'll talk to you again on Tuesday. And until then, we'll see you later.